Great, thanks, Brian. So yeah, like Brian said, um, I'll talk a little bit about some uh, power hardware and loop tests we did here at NREL um, using a megawatt scale grid forming inverter, including a scenario where we took the real time system under test all the way down to zero inertia and saw that the grid forming inverter was able to stabilize the system, which was kind of cool. Um, this was obviously not just my work, but the work of a pretty large team, including a bunch of folks from NREL and Hawaiian Electric. Um, but Chamek, Wallace, Ben, Emmanuel, Schwan, and Jin definitely all deserve a lot of the credit, as does the Hawaii, the HECO team. Um, and um, so, by you know, by way of background, I guess, I mean, why are we all here? As we start to get to ever higher levels of of integration of wind and solar in the power system. Um, we get to scenarios where sometimes 70, 80, 90, or even 100% of the generation at any given moment could come from wind, solar, and batteries, inverter-based resources. Um, and, um, and that actually comes sooner than you might think, because you know even if you get to sort of 50, 60, 70% annual penetration, you're already getting up to 70, 89% peak instantaneous penetration. So it's important that peaks that folks start thinking about how are we gonna make that happen? And when we think grid forming inverters, the subject of the unified consortium, of course, might be a, a key component there. So this is specifically we're in this project, we're focusing on some tests that we did with a, an island of Maui planning system that uh, would look at the ability to take it from, at the time, what was a 76% peak renewable penetration. I think they're actually at like almost 90% now um, peak, uh, up all the way to 100% um, and see how the dynamics of that system would change. Um, you know, why did we focus on Maui? Uh, HECO expects Maui to be one of the first systems to be able to, at least from an energy perspective, reach 100% wind, solar, and battery uh, generation. Um, and, and partly that's because they're limited in terms of what other resources are available. They don't have much hydro, geothermal, um, or other, I guess, uh, synchronous type of renewables. Uh, resources available on the island. So it, it tends to be wind, solar, and battery once they think about their future operations, potentially with some some sort of two appear grid forming, uh, sorry, some, some sort of two appear firm type of renewables if we can manage to make something like that work. Uh, this is a you know an interconnected power system with 69 kV voltage levels and a transmission system connecting remote generation around the island. So, you know, we're not talking about a microgrid here. This is a 200 megawatt system. So pretty good size system, obviously not um, the size of an interconnected power system on the mainland, but big enough so that you have some of those same uh, dynamics. Um, the stuff I'm going to talk about here, uh, the, the HIL test results um, were preceded by an EMT study in PSCAD led by uh, uh, Wallace Kenyon, really, who was part of our team, um, who, you know, so we built up a PSCAD model and, and ran through a bunch of scenarios with different levels of synchronous generation online. I'll actually talk a little bit about those just as background for um, for the HIL tests. And then in the in parallel, he goes doing their studies uh, with their consultant electronics to look at these types of operations as well. Uh, they also saw that grid forming inverters were really important for the future stability of the power system. Um, and of course, you know, these studies I'm talking about here are just pieces of a larger process that needs to be completed to be able to be confident that we could operate the system in the type of scenarios we're talking about here. Okay, so here's the, the system um, that, we're, that we're testing. It was, at the time, it was a 2023 um, planning case from, the, from HECO. Um, uh, this was, you know, a couple of years ago when we first got the system from them. So the system has since the planning cases have since changed, you know, in, in various ways. But it's still interesting to look at this case. It's a case with about 145 megawatts of peak load. Um, of that peak load, a whole lot is coming from distributed PV. You can see over 100 megawatts in this planning case from distributed PV. So this is like small scale rooftop PV. Definitely going to be grid following and. You know, we don't really necessarily even have good models of the dynamics of it. Um, and then and some additional uh, wind on the system, uh, three large 
uh, utility PV battery plants, their instantaneous output is not much, um, but their ratings are a total of 75 megawatts. Um, so have a significant effect on the dynamics of the system. Um, let's see what else. They have a significant proportion of synchronous condensers online. I think there's six synchronous condensers online in the base case here, uh, which is uh, more than they're currently planning to have on the system. Um, but that was the planning case at the time. Um, and in the base case, uh, there are no grid forming inverters online. In fact, none of the plants in this setup were planned to be grid forming. Some of them might be maybe converted to grid forming um, if possible, uh, but the base case it didn't include that um, because this is coming from a few years back when grid forming inverters on a transmission system were still kind of a novel idea. They still are, I suppose, a novel idea, but becoming more commonplace to at least think about. Um, and a few of them are actually out there in the world today. Um, we're going to focus specifically on this plant here, which is a 60 megawatt plant just divided into two 30 megawatt um, points of connection, um, which is a, a, it's a PV battery plant, DC coupled. Um, and, um, you know, by default, it would be operating in grid following mode. But, uh, you know, we, we work with the vendor of that plant too, and they have been able to convert plants like this into grid forming in the past. So sort of an interesting possibility there. Um, and then you can also see that, you know, this is a, as I said, like a, not a microgrid, but rather a pretty networked distribution uh, transmission system uh, with generation loads all over the place. You can see quite a bit of attributed PV or these yellow boxes aggregated it, um, up in different locations around the system. Um, okay, so we started from the utilities uh, PSSE model. Uh, and developed uh, a PSCAD model, which is obviously an electric magnetic transient domain model, uh, and parallelized that up onto 30 cores um, on a dedicated workstation. Um, and we, we took the time to actually try to validate that PSSC model against a field event. This is a 2017 event that happened where um, there was a line to ground fault that caused a generator to trip. Uh, and you can see a pretty big frequency transient uh, from the field measurements in the purple case there, um, you can see our PSSE model got a decent match and then the PSCAD model, a pretty decent match as well. One thing you do notice is that there's this oscillation at about 0.4 Hertz that doesn't show up in either of the models, but does show up in the field data. Um, we were a little concerned that we couldn't actually capture that um, at first. Um, it, it turns out this oscillation doesn't show up in future events and also wasn't captured in the utilities model. And we just didn't have the data to figure out where it was coming from uh, to actually model it correctly. And so since it wasn't showing up in more recent events, we decided not to not to worry about that oscillation. Um, you can see we get a pretty good match between the field data um, on the left and the EMT simulation on the right. Obviously not perfect, but close enough that we can think we have a pretty good representation of the model in PSCAD. Um, then we use that model to run a bunch of, of EMT simulations. Um, starting from that scenario one, which is this, what I, what I call the de minimum dispatch on the a couple of slides ago. Um, and then we develop a bunch of scenarios on there by basically starting to take off synchronous generators and synchronous condensers. If you go to start going down the left side and go down to scenario two, three, four, five, which are basically just starting to take off some of the synchronous condensers, basically re 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 reducing the inertia of the system, the random machines in the system, the fault current available to the system, all these sorts of um, metrics that people get concerned about. Um, you can also go down the right path here where you start by taking off the synchronous generators first. Uh, so that produces scenario six, which still has all the synchronous condensers, but no synchronous generators. And then you can eventually take off all the synchronous machines and get down to scenario seven, which was one with no utility side inertia. Uh, there was a really small amount of behind the meter hydro that I understand is not actually online, but we put it in the model just in case it affected the dynamics in a way that um, might, uh, might matter. Um, so you can see it's actually in the EMT simulations, at least it's not actually zero inertia, though we do run some cases where we trip it offline and go down to zero. Um, for comparison of with other systems around the world, we all, I'm also putting up the inertia constant here. Um, so you can sort of put it in per unit terms and say, compare it to other systems. So even the day minimum cases, 
inertia constant of around one, which is you know near to close to an order of magnitude below where your typical systems around the world would be at today. And then obviously we're going down from there down to uh, about zero. Um, just to sort of put it in context, not that inertia is necessarily the thing that we need to be worried about here, but it's just one way of quantifying how many machines are online uh, relative to the size of the system, relative to the total generation capacity online in the system. Um, so that's a little bit for context there. Uh, then we simulated a bunch of events. I'm not going to focus necessarily on all these events, but I highlighted a couple that we'll talk a little bit more about. One is event E1, which is a three-phase false on, on a low short circuit ratio bus. Um, and there's another event, which is the loss of largest synchronous generator, sorry, loss of gen largest generator, actually is a 21, 21 megawatt wind plant. Um, and then, uh, so those are the main events we'll take a look at. And then the, the other thing I wanted to note here, here is that we decided since HECO was in parallel doing a detailed interconnection study, system stability study that with detailed plant models, et cetera, um, that would focus on things like what are the effects of momentary cessation or what are the effects of other you know, events of DER stripping or under frequency load shedding, some of these more discrete events that could affect the stability of the system. We decided to instead focus our study on the oscillatory stability of the system, the dynamic stability of the system. You could think of it as small signal stability, I suppose, but it's really large signal events. Um, so, so the UFLS and DER trip settings, DER momentary cessation are all disabled um, in the simulations and HIL tests that I'll start to show here. Okay, so let's look at some, some traces of, of some of these simulations. So if we look at that event E1, that fault on the low circuit ratio bus, um, the, in scenario one, base case, you can see that the, you know, the fault happens and you get a frequency transient. If you look at the voltage or power or things, you get a pretty big voltage transient too. The, you know, it's, it's a, not that big of an island. So when you get a fault on a, a three phase fault, the voltage across the whole island goes pretty low. Uh, so the power, there's quite a big power transient. You get this frequency transient as well. Um, so that's the base case. Everything recovers pretty nicely. Uh, it simulates fine in PSCAD and also in PSSE, which is of course a positive sequence. Um, domain simulation. If we go to scenario two, you get a bigger transient, but things eventually recover. Uh, again, simulates okay in PSSC and in PSCAD. The PSSC simulations are the dotted lines here. And then I guess also worth pointing out here, the difference between the red and green traces. The red is a um, PLL derived frequency at uh, one of the synchronous generators. Uh, sorry, at, at one of the buses. Uh, and then the green is a rotor speed derived frequency uh, at, at a, one of the generators that's on that bus. Uh, so you can see quite a bit more transient activity in the PLL derived frequency. Of course, it's gonna depend on what type of PLL and how is it tuned and all these sorts of things. Frequency measurement is pretty challenging for these type of cases. Um, so that's why we put the rotor speed on there as well. Uh, and then if we go to scenario three, which is getting down to be pretty low inertia, uh, I think there's just two synchronous condensers left online with um, a H constant of something like 0 0.4 uh, seconds. Um, then you can see we get pretty big transients, especially in the PLL derived frequency, um, but also in the rotor speed frequency, uh, including some five or six Hertz uh, oscillations here that result in really big frequency transients enough to have probably tripped off most of the DERs, which if you recall, they were two thirds of the generation. So this would have probably been a, a non-viable case. This would really have resulted in a system crash. Um, notably also PSSE crashed partway through. So you can see right in here, the dotted lines end because the PSSE became numerically unstable. Um, so we really, you know, as we expected, needed to have a an EMT simulation of this scenario to get it to look right. Um, so that's the uh, frequency in that case. You can also look at voltages in that case. And you can see that those uh, higher frequency oscillations are showing up throughout the system in the voltage as well, um, you know, which is mediating into active power uh, oscillations and reactive power oscillations in all of the different generators. Um, so this is basically like a classic you know, weak grid instability type of situation, but happening all around the island as opposed to in a, in a certain location. 
Um, okay, and so now if we if we take a look at the damping ratio of the dominant mode from some of these oscillations, and uh, sort of plot it relative to uh, the inertia of the system in those cases, and you can say that as you start to reduce the inertia, you get uh, lower and lower um, damping ratios until the system eventually becomes unstable in scenarios five, uh, four, and five, which are even lower inertia scenarios. The difference between scenario three and scenario four is not so much in the amount of inertia online, but just in the location where it is on the island. So you can see that the location does make some difference um, in, in how stabilizing um, those synchronous condensers are. Um, and then it finally becomes unstable in scenario five, which is, uh, I think, around a 0 0.2 seconds of inertia. That's all, again, all with grid following inverters. Similar result with um, with a loss of generation type of event. Scenario one looks pretty nice. Scenario three, uh, again, becomes unstable. Interestingly, scenario six, which is again, jump back up here so you can sort of see what that was. Scenario six was um, only one step away from the um, base case, but that step involved taking off all the synchronous generators. So this system basically consists of, of grid following inverters and synchronous machines. And interestingly, its dynamics look, look just fine. So we, there's actually a couple of publications out there that you can see where at least for this type of scenario that we're simulating, the, the island looks pretty stable with the combination of sufficient amounts of synchronous condensers and grid following inverters without any grid forming. Kind of an interesting result there. Um, it's probably worth noting though that in, in the utility study where they modeled momentary cessation, they saw that huge loss of active power in some of their events as the voltage dropped really low. Um, and the synchronous condensers weren't as much help for that scenario. They really need that fast injection of active power. And so, um, so if you look at the utility studies, you'll see that you actually probably do, at least for their island with huge amounts of DERs, uh, need some grid forming online to keep the scenario stable. Um, we also took a look, quick look. This is just a you know brief overview of, of a thing that there's a whole separate paper on of what is what level of detail do you need in the models of the inverters to be able to capture all these types of um, oscillations that we're starting to see. And sort of the most interesting one is to look at a scenario three where we have four different types of models running uh, all the same event. One is a model, it's still an average switch model of the converter, but it has the full current and power loops. Um, so that's the uh, green trace there. Then the magenta trace has just the power loops. And then the um, turquoise is more like a ideal current source type model of the, um, of the inverter based resources. And you can see that the only one that really fully captures the full magnitude of these oscillations is the one with the current and power loops involved. So that was interesting to see. You know, you will find some models out there that try to simplify up some of that down, uh, and they would clearly miss this oscillation if they if you took those simplifying assumptions. So that was an interesting result. To seem to sort of sum up all those um, HIL, sorry, the EMT simulation results. Um, you can see that these scenarios, you can call them the higher inertia scenarios or scenarios with more uh, synchronous online, were all uh, stable with or without grid forming inverters. Um, we needed to add 30 MVA of grid forming to get scenarios three and four to be stable. And then you needed to add 60 MVA of grid forming to get scenarios five and seven to be, to be more stable or to be stable. Um, and you can kind of see that all plotted down here relative to the inertia of the system. Okay, so that's EMT simulations. Here's some squiggly lines to show how it looks like to simulate some of these with grid forming inverters online. Um, so this is uh, scenario three, which was that one where it sort of became unstable, event eight, loss of largest generator um, with um, K1, which is, well, basically what I could, I could summarize that as, as basically everything online is grid following in this scenario 
all the inverters anyway. Um, and you can see it has this large transient and, and would have resulted in a system crash. If we put 30 MVA of grid forming, of grid following inverter into grid forming mode, then we see a much cleaner transient, a nice recovery, uh, damping of the faster modes. Um, everything looks pretty good there. The one questionable thing potentially is the rate of change of frequency. Um, it is improved in this case relative to the case without grid forming, but it's still pretty fast. So there's some question, how are the DERs, the rooftop PV gonna to respond to that rate of change of frequency? Will it still be, will they still be online and stable? Um, is, is somewhat of a question. But if that bridge is crossed, then things look pretty good with 30 MVA of grid forming for, for this, again, about 145 MVA uh, load system. So pretty big benefit to grid forming there. You can look at the actual uh, plant output. Um, and the, the plot I wanted to focus on in this slide here is the one on the right. So there's those, if you recall, there's two plants very similar to each other, 30 MVA right next to each other. Um, and we put the one in, in covered in the red trace in grid forming mode and the one in the green trace in grid following mode. And you can see a huge divergence in what they look like, much faster response from the grid forming plant. It almost looks like a little bit crazy what's going on with this plant. Turns out, well, it's just holding its voltage angle stable and this is how much power it needed to inject in order to do that. Uh, and so it actually was able to stabilize the system, at least in this EMT simulation. So um, again, kind of a cool result there. Um, if we go all the way down to the scenario uh, seven, which is with no synchronous resources online uh, and put two of the um, plants in grid forming mode. So that's a total of 60 MVA. And you can see it survived that uh, loss of largest generator event. The grid forming inverters inject a lot of power really fast. They'd actually have to have that much headroom, of course. It's worth noting, you know, this is suddenly they're um, more than tripling, almost quadrupling their power output to, um, to stabilize that event. But at least in the simulation, it works. Again, pretty large rate of change of frequency of six hertz per second but only for a very short amount of time, right? So like uh, only a few cycles really. So are the DERs gonna survive that? Uh, it'll be interesting to see. We're doing a little testing right that right now to see if we can find out actually. Um, so interesting result there, encouraging in, in EMT. Although of course, we're not the only ones to have shown the EMT, you know, that a grid forming inverter can stabilize a system. So that's, but you know, nice to see that for this specific model. Okay, so that kind of concludes the initial portion where I just wanted to summarize the, the EMT simulations. And now we can talk about the hardware in the loop um, tests, which is um, a little bit of a newer result. Although I have you know, presented this in a few other places. Um, so you may have seen some of these slides before. Um, if you do, feel free, if you have, feel free to get some coffee or whatever, if you like. Um, this is, um, uh, so this is a hardware and loop test setup. It's a little bit, unique compared to other HIL test setups in that, you know, we have a two MVA inverter as the device under test. Uh, so, so fairly large, very large voltage amplifier or grid simulator um, providing the interface. Um, and uh, so, so if we sort of summarize what's going on here, we've got a real time model of Maui, the one that I talked about before, running in an RTDS simulator. We pick out the voltage at the um, point of interconnection of one of these plants, K1 specifically, and put the actual waveforms of that voltage uh, onto this grid simulator. So it'll play those voltage waveforms. This inverter will see those voltage waveforms and it will react however it reacts, pick up the current coming out of it and play it back into the model. Um, obviously this is a closed loop system. It's got its dynamics. Um, it doesn't have infinite bandwidth. Um, so, so we can't claim that this is perfect by any means, but it's a it pretty, um, we're pretty confident that it captures uh, most of the dynamics below some certain bandwidth pretty well. Um, okay, and so I guess what else to say about this? This K1 plant is representing a 30 MVA PV best plant, but it's a two MVA inverter. And what we actually did is we took the rating of the, ba of the battery, which is one megawatt and multiplied this output by 30 so that you're actually seeing 30 times the inverter here is what we really have in hardware. It's as if it was a 30 megawatt plant when it's really a one megawatt plant. It's worth noting though that it's got a 2.2 MVA inverter. So it really has a little bit of extra fault current behind it too. 
this wasn't necessarily uh, an intentional choice to like uh, create a higher fault current from the inverter, but it may actually have helped stabilize the, the system as well. So it would be interesting to take to sort of rerun these tests with this as a one MVA inverter or, or scaling based on this two MVA instead of on the battery scale um, and see if you get similar results. Um, and then this other plant, K2, the other 30 MVA that's right next to it, um, is still represented in the real-time model by another plant um, that can be operated in grid forming or grid following mode. Ah, sorry, going back to the hardware inverter. So this is an off-the-shelf um, inverter from a major manufacturer that uh, can be operated in grid forming or grid following mode. It's actually kind of an older version of their grid forming uh, firmware at this point, um, but you know, it seems pretty reliable so far in what we've seen. Um, all the other inverter-based resources, wind, distributed PV, et cetera, are still gonna stay in grid following mode in all these simulations. I think that covers everything I wanted to cover here. Uh, this RSCAD model is obviously not identical to the PSCAD model that we were showing on the previous slide that it was converted, but that dynamics match pretty well and has roughly the same level of detail, a little bit more aggregation to be able to get it to run in real time on 50 microsecond time steps. Okay, so that's the hardware and loop model. We use that to run very similar set of scenarios, not exact same set of scenarios, but still starting from that same scenario one and including same scenarios two, three, six, five, and seven. We added an additional scenario here, uh, which is, so in this case, there are um, two synchronous condensers online. Then we trip one of them. So if there's one synchronous condenser online, get down to uh, a scenario with, um, no synchronous condensers and just synchronous generators online, and then again, no inertia online in the system. Minor detail here, we didn't model those small hydros in this model because we didn't see that they really model that mattered in the uh, dynamics of the um, EMT simulations. And also they're not really expected to be online um, in the future. Um, and you can see, I'm sort of, I guess, uh, Previewing the results here, you can see that a similar set of scenarios were stable um, as to the EMT simulations. Um, I'm gonna show a couple of, of squiggly lines as well to show how these uh, simulations looked. Um, but I'm just to sort of preview what we're gonna show. We're gonna take a look at this scenario, which is the one with no synchronous generation, but plenty of synchronous condensers, scenario six. We're gonna look at this trip of the second to last synchronous condenser here. So going from scenario three to scenario three A, these, uh, you know, we're transitioning from scenarios online with the model running in real time and the inverter connected. Uh, so you can actually capture these trips of synchronous condensers as sort of additional events. This one is interesting because it turns out to be sort of the boundary where stability is lost, um, at least with no grid uh, forming online. And then we'll also take a couple of looks at uh, this zero inertia scenario as well. Um, uh, one other thing probably worth noting on this slide is almost all these cases are really close to 100% inverter-based generation. And so it's not really the percent of inverter-based generation that is really, it seems to be related to the stability, but probably more so the amount of synchronous machines online that seems to make a big difference. Uh, you can also see this sort of preview of how much grid forming was needed to stabilize each case with the caveat that these are in pretty large steps of 30 MVA at a time. Uh, so we don't have really amazing resolution uh, on those numbers. Um, they could be a little bit lower. In other words, you could get away with a little bit less grid forming. Okay, so that's the sort of overview of the HIL tests. Um, and then we can take the last few sides are going to be about um, a few um, simulation traces. Okay, so this is again scenario six, which is all grid following and synchronous condensers. Um, the case, I'm showing the case with the, the fault event. So you can see the fault happens um, in all three cases with or without grid forming. Um, you see a pretty good response here and everything recovers pretty nicely. Um, the frequency is, you know, looks totally haywire when the fault is online. That's because we're measuring it with the PLL. Uh, so it's not getting good measurements while the fault is, is active. 
Um, let's see here. What else to say here? I mean, basically, I think um, this is an interesting case because it at least partially confirms this conclusion from before that with just grid following and synchronous condensers, you could have a stable system if you can get around this DER momentization issue, which is a big issue in Hawaii. And depending on where else you are in the world, it may or may not be a, a big issue. OK, so that's scenario six. Then we're going to go, I'm going to jump up first here. And look, next, we're going to look at this loss of the second to last synchronous condenser. So this is the transition from scenario three to three A. And I'm showing two cases here. The blue case is with the hardware inverter in grid forming mode, and the yellow is with it, uh, with, with nothing in grid forming mode. In other words, the hardware inverter is in grid following mode. You can see there's, even before the event, there's already a little bit of an oscillation going on. Um, and then when you drop the synchronous condenser here at three seconds, um, the oscillation amplitude goes up high enough that with this level of frequency changes, you'd be losing all the DERs and the system would crash. So in other words, this is not a stable or not a survivable event for the island, um, even though the oscillations do eventually dampen out in the case that we simulated. So this is basically showing, you know, with no grid forming online, where's the boundary of stability? In this case, it happened to be, if you had one synchronous condenser online, that was enough to keep it um, apparently stable. Um, what else? I think that's enough to say there. And then the last two cases I'm going to show are going to be that scenario seven, which is the zero inertia scenario or the zero synchronous machine scenario. Start by taking a look at the fault event. Three cases are shown here. There's a purple trace in there, which is uh, with 60 MVA, MVA of grid forming. There's a blue trace, which is with 30 MVA of grid forming coming from the hardware inverter. And then the Red trace is with 30 MVA of grid forming coming from the modeled inverter. So the hardware inverter is in grid following mode. Uh, another thing that I should point out for all these plots, these are always the measurements at the hardware inverter's 13.2 kV point of common coupling where it connects to uh, the grid simulator. Um, so you can see pretty big difference between it in grid forming mode which is the red trace and it in grid falling mode, which is the blue trace. Um, in, um, in grid falling mode, you could maybe claim that the system would survive this scenario. In grid forming mode, uh, sorry, in grid falling mode, it actually tripped offline uh, shortly after the event. Oh, sorry, in grid forming mode, it tripped offline shortly after the event. This, this sort of emphasized one of the challenges with grid forming mode is that fault ride through actually becomes a little bit more challenging um, in, in grid forming mode because you have to deal with how you limit the current when it's, it's coming up to one of its limits. I think the manufacturers updated their way of dealing with the situation now. So you might get a slightly different result. Um, so you, you could say that for this fault event, um, well, um, actually, if you look at the magnitude of these frequency changes, this would have been, again, enough to trip off large amounts of generation and load. And so we're considering this not to be a survivable scenario, uh, this fault event for scenario seven, with the 30 MVA of grid forming. But then if you look at the purple trace with the 60 MVA of grid forming, so both the hardware and the modeled uh, plant are in grid forming mode, you can see that the, the frequency recovers nicely. Um, the voltage recovers nicely. The active and reactive power from the hardware inverter are, are nice and smooth and stable. So it's definitely survivable with 60 MVA of grid forming for this scenario. Okay, same scenario now, but looking at a gener generation trip event, uh, and the same three cases are shown here. Um, for this event, all three scenarios are potentially survivable. Um, one thing that's interesting to see is the two scenarios where the hardware inverters in grid forming mode, so the blue and the purple, you can see a much faster response um, to the generation trip relative to the inverter in grid following mode, which is the red trace here. That's, to me, summarizes one of the primary differences, right? That, that the grid forming inverter is basically just injecting whatever it needs to to keep its voltage uh, phase angle 
and magnitude stable at its output, um, which provides that inertia-like response and, and provides a, a stabilizing method for the system. Um, so, you know, you could say that all these scenarios are survivable here, although it's worth noting that really the fault event for this same scenario wasn't, wasn't survivable. So for this case, what we said was, well, you have to have 60 MVA of grid forming for the system to survive uh, this in this uh, operating scenario. All right, so that's the last of squiggly lines. A couple of conclusions here, and we can move to some discussion. So, you know, the most notable conclusion, um, not necessarily unexpected, but still kind of cool to see in a hardware test, uh, was that this real hardware grid forming inverter can stabilize other otherwise unstable scenarios of the of the transmission system, including that zero inertia case. Um, you know, it, it mitigates the faster oscillatory modes. Notably, it also provides a stable uh, voltage for the other grid following inverters to to operate against. Um, and we get similar results from both the hardware tests and the EMT um, results. So that's, again, encouraging. Um, I mentioned that you need pretty detailed modeling in the EMT model of the grid following inverters to be able to even see these issues we're concerned about here. This is a conclusion I wanted to sort of pause on for a second here. So what I did here is plotted the inertia constant of the system. In other words, how many machine MVA are online, whether that's condensers or um, generators um, versus how much grid forming was needed to stabilize it. And then I just put a little linear regression line across there and you can see that once you get down to about 0 0.8 seconds of inertia constant, you start to need some grid forming. Um, get down to about 0 0.4 seconds, you need about 30 MVA and then you needed that 60 MVA um, which would, turns out to be 30% of the capacity of the system or a little bit under 30%. Um, so this you know, is an interesting result in that you know, it's saying for this, for this system, if you have about a third of the generation in grid forming mode, you can stabilize it with no um, synchronous machines online. And as you add more synchronous machines, you need a, little, a, a few fewer um, inverters. And so, you know, how system specific is this? How inverter control specific is this? All those things are questions that would be interesting to, to look at. I'd be curious if others have similar results to sort of talk about and say, you know, can we draw lines like this for other systems? And do they look pretty similar or do they look different? And how do they depend on different aspects of the system that we could quantify? How do we know, in other words, how much grid forming we need to have to have a stable system without necessarily simulating every case in EMT, and PSCAD, or, or even running an HIL test? Um, so that's an interesting topic for future work there, I think. Um, again, I, um, uh, we're just looking at you know, these oscillatory stability dynamics. We're not looking at the protection system. We're not looking at how to make sure you have enough reserves at the right time. We're not looking at resource adequacy, all these other challenges that we would need to address to actually operate a system like this. Um, and I think that's the end. Okay, well, one more slide. So I, I, based on this linear regression here, I, I kind of thought, well, could we come up with a new constant, some kind of a new metric that would give you an idea of how likely a stable system is to be stable? Starting with something like an inertia constant, but um, in trying to add in grid forming capacity into the inertia, and maybe you multiply that capacity by some kind of a constant, depending on, and maybe that constant is close to one, or maybe it's less than one, meaning that the grid, the inverters are less stabilizing, or maybe it's more than one, meaning the inverters are more stabilizing than the, than the machine. Um, how would you determine those constants? Not sure, maybe you could run a bunch of simulations, maybe you could do some small signal modeling. I'm, I think it would be an interesting topic to take a look at. Uh, and you know, I put two versions of it here. One is where we think of MVA seconds here in the numerator and one's where we think of just MVA or um, in, the, in the numerator. Um, so in other words, could we develop such some kind of a metric like this that would predict stability of the system and could you use a metric like that in scheduling and dispatch and even, even capacity generation capacity planning to make sure that you have enough grid forming in your system as you plan and operate your system? So I think that's the end. Again, thanks to everybody that we collaborated with um, on this. Uh, it was a pretty exciting project to work on. Thanks to, uh, um, thanks to the audience for listening in. I guess we can pause there and take any questions.